I'm here in a hotel north of Barcelona, currently hiding from a very, very serious wind, about to embark on a several hundred mile journey back home in a brand new Kia. And I'm currently being reminded of a story I once saw told by Murray Walker. It took place during the, I believe the late 1950s, at the Isle of Man TT races, a very famous motorbike race. Now, of course, at that time, the race was dominated by the British brands, Triumph, Norton, BSA, and so on. Then one year, this bunch of Japanese engineers arrive, and everybody knew that they were there from Honda. Now, you must remember, this was a very different time. Anti-Japanese sentiment was still rather high, thanks to the war, various other things, and of course, cultural politics of the 1950s. And these guys were there, they weren't competing, they were just there, they were watching, they were looking at everything, they were paying very serious attention to what was going on. They were taking photographs of all the bikes and things, and then they disappeared, went off home. Then, no one heard from them the following year. The year after that, there was announced that there was going to be a Honda entry at the Isle of Man TT. Now everybody remembered the fact that they'd come to the races and photographed all these British bikes and they thought, ha, we know what's going to happen. They're going to come over and they're going to turn up with this complete Japanese replica of a two-year-old Triumph or something. They've just, they've just taken pictures and they're going to copy and cheat and basically just have what the British do. Well, the Japanese team arrived, they turned up and they unloaded their bikes. They were half the size and weight of the British bikes. They were every bit as powerful, they outhandled them, and they absolutely demolished them on the circuits. The British had no idea what had just happened. They decided to kind of carry on regardless, and unfortunately, British racing bikes and British road bikes never really evolved. And about 20 years later, nobody in Britain wanted to buy a British bike anymore. Same thing happened with Japanese cars in America in the 1970s. Start of the decade, no one by Japanese. End of the decade, it's what everybody wanted. And the reason I relate this story is because being here with Kia, I can see exactly the same thing happening. A few years ago, if somebody told you that they bought a Kia, generally you'd probably be a little bit confused and I will confess that I would be one of those people. I go, I mean, I know they've got the long warranty and everything, but I can't really think about anything particularly exciting about a Kia. I mean, the most that people knew about a Kia was generally the fact that one of them had been a star in the reasonably priced car in Top Gear. And those cars were deliberately chosen for their sort of, um, I, I hesitate to use the word, but, but average quality. They were not supposed to be standout cars. I mean, who really remembers the Chevrolet Lissetti for anything other than its role in that program? But. I've been working with Kia now, as a, as a guest, they don't pay me or anything like that. I've been on about three or four events with them and had a couple of cars out of them. And now having also driven a lot of their older vehicles as well, you can see this drive that they have, this aim to become a real serious global player. You know, they're, they're skipping straight past the sort of Japanese competitions and the Hondas and that of the world. I mean, they're going straight for companies like Lexus, BMW, Audi, Mercedes. They want a badge that people respect, and the way they're doing that is basically the hard way. They're building better and better cars. I mean, we're about to do several hundred miles in one of these, and I know it's going to be a great time. Exactly how the car's going to drive, I don't know because I've had only limited experience so far, but that's why we're here today filming a video to find out just how good it can be. They've pinched lots of people from all over the place, Albert Beerman from BMW M, for example and they know how to treat these people. They're giving them the freedom that they need to do their jobs. Also, that seven-year warranty. I mean, it's not just a sales gimmick. It's not just something to kind of get cars out the door. The only reason that a car company can offer a warranty like that, and in America, by the way, they do a different thing. They have a 10-year powertrain warranty. But in the UK, it's a seven-year or 100,000-mile warranty. The only reason that they can do that is because they have complete and utter faith in their engineering. I mean, this car's got Kia's own gearbox in it. How many other companies out there build their own gearboxes? The only one that I can really think of is Toyota, the largest car company in the world. And Kia slash Hyundai, 
they're not that far behind. I mean, let's face it, before the Stinger, there wasn't really a Kia that I was kind of super interested in. And now I've driven quite a few of them and looked at seven of them, I'm like, Actually, when people come to me for car recommendations, which they do all the time, I will happily recommend a Kia. And I've no doubt there's plenty of you out there that are probably watching this thinking, yeah, he's just saying nice things because, you know, he's been invited out to somewhere and he's getting wined and dined by a Kia. And look, I love coming out and doing these events. They're absolutely fantastic and wonderful. But there's something else I can tell you as well. My face is itchy. Big companies, the way that they behave it's very, very clear when you deal with anyone in them. If you deal with a company whose management are unsympathetic, uncaring, you know, very numbers driven and, and not focused on people at all, that's evident when you deal with, with the little people too. When we deal with Kia, they're very nice to us, they're very friendly, they're very, very personable. We were dealing with senior management yesterday. Look, we are a very, very, very small YouTube channel. Our opinion globally doesn't mean an awful lot. Not yet, anyway, I'm hoping one day it might. But we're treated with the utmost respect and friendliness, and they're lovely, and anything we want to do is not a hassle. I mean, we're here basically in the hotel on our own. Everybody else is flying home today. We're driving a car 900 miles home because we asked if we could do that to get some better footage for you guys. And it was absolutely no problem for them. And when the people we deal with, you can imagine how many layers there are between the PR people to the head of the company back in Korea. I can tell you that if the people at this level are nice and friendly and respectful and easy to deal with, the people at that level probably are too. They care about their people and they care about their cars. And from the people that I know that have bought these, they generally care about their customers as well. So if you're shopping for a new car and you're not looking for something that's a, a supercar or a sports car or something super exciting because they don't have one of those yet, if you just want a car, you could do a hell of a lot worse than a Kia. I can tell you that. Maybe the next time you're at a Kia dealership or near one, stick your head in and have a look because honestly, the Koreans are coming. <laughs>